go. Okay, so recording is happening. Um, and I share that just, just in case there's a sensitivity about being on camera. If there is, please just switch your, your camera off. We'll find a way to bring you in a little bit later on question and answer and conversation. Um, the breakout rooms when we have them are not recorded. Um, and this is a, a resource that we're hoping becomes useful for, uh, for other folks later and find a way, to, a way and a place to share it through Laura's website and through uh, my website. Um, but Laura, yes, why don't you just say hi and come on in. Hi everyone, I'm so happy to be here and I really am grateful that you're taking the time out of your schedule to come and join Andrew and I. Um, we're excited to speak about nervous system. That's what really came up for us during the podcast interview that we did, that we um, both, you know, are very passionate about regulating the nervous system and specifically how adults' nervous system regulation impacts their children and um, all of the tools that we have as adults to help support us and also why that's so important when we're under a very intense, stressful period like a pandemic going on right now. Mm. Thanks, Laura. Um, I would like to give us a roadmap. Everything that we're, we're, we're doing, um, how this call is starting, how we're coming in together, the intention is to begin to create a regulated field and system for us together as we come in today. So, you know, take a breath wherever you are and give yourself a, a score out of 10 where, where um, uh, um, let's, let, me, let me say I've got to work out my scoring system here, but where uh, on the one end, you're super frazzled. In other words, the question is, how calm and centered are you? And if you're not at all calm and centered, you're going to give yourself maybe a one out of 10. And if it's like you just finished your best ever meditation um, and uh, you're, you're right in the center of that zone of calmness, then give yourself a 10. Um, and I'd love for you to just put your answer into the chat box so we can start to get a little feel as to you know, what's in the room. Um, and, and, and then also to track as we go, you know, if I ask this question again in, in an hour's time, let's see where you are and let's see whether today can be a process where you can move, you know, from a, from a one to a three or from a seven to a nine, um, just a little bit as we, as we are here today um, together. And here's our roadmap for today. Again, sharing a roadmap is part of a process to create calmness and centeredness in the system because you know a little bit about where we're going. So we're going to start with something called a brain smart start. Uh, learn a little bit more about Laura and myself after that. Um, meet each other, which, uh, which is going to grow our community. And then Laura is going to come in with uh, her wisdom from her professional uh, development um, in, in working with families, working with young kids um, as a, a, a chiropractor, holistic healthcare practitioner. Um, um, I, I, I'm not sure I've said that the way you would say that, Laura, but I think it points to, to that I want to, I will, we'll hear that from you. We'll do a little brain break so that we can get up and move and not get caught down in, in 90 minutes of staring at a screen. Um, and then there'll be time for story time uh, because that's, you know, that's what I'm about. I'm about bedtime stories and uh, we'll talk a little bit about why and about why the last 20 minutes of the day matter in this process of co-regulating. Um, there'll be lots and lots of time for chit chat, Q and A, and for us to get to know you better and hear what it is that you're uh, working with, and um, we'll send you on your way with, you know, many ideas about your uh, how to regulate your own nervous system, and then transmit that to your kids so that we have a uh, a co-regulated uh, field. Um, but there'll be five particular ones that we come up to at the end of the day. So. Um, just a thumbs up if that sounds like a good, a good path for the next uh, little while. Um, that I'm seeing lots of thumbs up. That's wonderful. Um, I can't see the chat right now, but the chat is available for us to use as we go as well. And Laura might be able to watch it when, I'm, when I can't see it and the other way around. Um, and so we'll be helping and supporting each other. So, breathing in, breathing out. Uh, Dr. Becky Bailey, 
the queen bee and founder of Conscious Discipline, um, has created for us this process called the Brain Smart Start. And it's being used by kindergarten teachers, um, elementary teachers, you know, with young kids. That's the point I'm trying to make. Um, a lot of the time in a lot of classes, all 50 states in the U.S. do it. Uh, the, the China has a commitment to get 100,000 kids through um, the conscious discipline model um, over the next period of years. So South Africa um, uh, uh, has its first uh, certified instructor. So this is a fantastic uh, model, and it's, it's dense and rich with so many things, but it's also got this real simplic simplicity to get started each time kids gather. And I think of us as kids, and we're gathering for the first time, and so we don't know each other yet, and we want to set our brain up for the greatest possibility to have access to our curiosity, to have access to our natural learning, to in some way put down any of the stress that we might have arrived to the room with. Um, and there are four steps to that, um, that that help you do it. They're quick steps, um, but I just wanted to give them to you here intellectually. I'm gonna stop the screen share and we're gonna do them together. We're gonna to do a little activity to, um, uh, to unite. Uh, we're gonna do an activity with our bodies to disengage stress. Um, we're going to do something that's a little bit playful to connect and then we're going to invite you if it feels right to make a commitment for your um, time here today. Um, and if we do all this, um, it's going to set our, uh, set our brain up for um, a great hour together. Uh, 90 minutes, hour. Oh, let's go. Okay, so here's our activity to unite. So uh, bring your hands up please so that you can touch your fingers like this. What we're going to do is peace begins with me. All right. And we're going to do that three times. And I invite you to say it where you are out loud, if you can. Um, I know we might not hear you because everyone's on mute, but Laura and I, you're here. So let's do that together. Breathing in, breathing out. Peace, peace begins, begins with, with me. me. Peace, peace begins, begins with with me, peace, peace begins, begins with, with me. me. Fabulous. So we all, very simple, but we all did it together. So there's our uniting activity. Now we're going to look to disengage stress. And, and stress hides in our body. We can't always see it. So we're going to do something which is known as the, as the drain breathing. And so we're going to breathe and squeeze, 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 squeeze. And then we're going to let go. And we'll do that three times together. So breathing in, squeeze, 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 and let go. There we go, nice sigh. Breathing in. And one more time. Squeeze, 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 and let go. That's nice, a little bit of movement that naturally comes in, shaking that off. That was our action to disengage stress. Now I'd like us to do something to connect. And so my invitation is that you have this in gallery view so that you can see everybody else who's here on the Zoom call. And I'd like you to take your right hand and I'd like you to cover your left eye and I'd like you to lean in a little bit and smile and just look at everybody else who's doing this because it's ridiculous, <laughs> okay? And we can let that go, and we're gonna pick up the other hand, left hand, across to the right eye. Okay, lean in a little bit, and smile, and just, just have a look at everybody else is doing this. I, I notice I can't see anything out of my left eye. <laughs> um, and we can let go of that. And now we're gonna take both hands, we're gonna cross them over, and we're gonna cup our ears, and we're gonna come in and lean in a little bit and smile. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fabulous. That was our little connection exercise. I, I, I just made that up yesterday. It felt really silly and we did it. So to, con to finish our, our brain smart start, there's an opportunity here to uh, make a commitment. And as I was thinking about this, it felt like uh, in the subject of co-regulation, it's very clear that a stressed grown-up can't calm uh, a stressed child, that, that we would be at odds 
with each other energetically. We'd be sending a mixed message in the subtle dimensions. Um, and so uh, we have to take that responsibility of learning how to calm ourselves first, putting our own oxygen mask on first. So if it feels right for you, then the commitment that we're going to make today is to commit to take care of ourselves first so that we can better take care of um, our children or the children in our care. And if that feels right for you, then just place a hand on your heart. Um, find your own way to say, um, I commit to take care of myself first, knowing that it will better enable me to take care of the little ones around me. Breathing in, breathing out. Beautiful, beautiful. And that's our brain smart start. So Laura, why, why is this such an interesting subject for you? How does it fit into your work? Why don't you share a little bit about um, your work and what you find yourself doing every day that, that makes this subject fascinating for you? Mm -hmm. So as a family wellness chiropractor, I have had the pleasure of working with families for 17 years and What's been really fascinating to me is um, in the beginning of my practice, I would see one person from a family and typically it would be related to back and neck pain. And then as my practice evolved and I was doing more wellness care, more care for pregnant women, care for, for newborns, then uh, I was still seeing a lot of symptom based, you know, reasons for patients coming into the office. Um, and it felt disconnected because let's say I'm taking care of a newborn, but this mother who just gave birth isn't receiving care and the dad who's stressed out and, has, and is it also like people are feeling physical, emotional pain and they're not receiving the care because that family member seemed to be the priority. So we've been able to really evolve our practice and educate our community why really the whole family needs to be under care. And it's really beautiful when we have entire families come in and they receive care and their nervous system is, is calmed and, and uh, connected because of the alignment correction and how that impacts the family dynamic. It's, it's really powerful. So they're not only physically feeling better when they leave the office, but their mood is improved. They're certainly calmer, they're less reactive, and it's just strengthening the relationship of that family dynamic hmm. yeah I, wow i mean i i totally get that that you know here, here's your little baby who now has a beautifully aligned system but they're living in a, a home where where mom's running stress dad's running stress and and the and the system is therefore running stress um and so what i'm hearing in that is that you 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 found a way to look at it systemically in the family unit um, and contextualize each person as they come in in some way relative to what, what's happening. And we, we do know that the family's family is one of our big stresses, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially for new families, because I see so many uh, pregnant and new moms and new parents. So it's, that's a very, it's a life, you know, change to, to become a parent. And um, there is, you know, stress that is, natural with that but it is about how can we make these parents feel supported um, because that will directly impact the connection that they're making with their child and that's you know directly like for example and i've even had pediatricians tell me the same thing when you see a colicky baby two three four months old you know it's not uncommon to see a colicky mom <laughs> like a mom who's feeling unsupported frazzled and anxious, right? And so, of course, her baby is just a reflection of that mother's anxiety. Hmm. And we are going to get into how those, uh, how mum's energy and child's energy are um, affecting each other in some way. Um, just as a quick introduction for those of you who I haven't met before, um, I am uh, an author and uh, a healer. That my healing background. Uh, includes a lot of developmental psychology. I got really interested in the first six years of life, uh, the impact of those six years in creating our belief systems, uh, the way we think, um, and then the impact of the way we think on the way we feel and how um, that leads to uh, stress or a relaxation and the power that we have that we can choose 
um, and change our physiological um, feeling uh, through our thinking. And um, the, the, the books that I write uh, group together under the name of the Conscious Bedtime Story Club, uh, stories like uh, The Hug Who Got Stuck that we will share together. Today I'll read that one, uh, The Boy Who Searched for Silence, um, The Elephant Who Tried to Tiptoe. Uh, if you ever want to know a little bit more about me, you just need to read the book title, Am I the Boy Who Searched for Silence? Absolutely. Am I being the elephant who tried to tiptoe and not being myself and trying to be someone else? Uh, yes. Uh, absolutely. And then what I realized over time was that most of us have done these things at, in some way, shape or form. And if we haven't yet gone looking for silence, there will come a time where we, we will do that. Um, if we haven't yet uh, forgotten who we are, we will forget and need to remember um, and come back into being ourselves. And again, from that centered place of self, uh, that is where regulation can truly uh, it truly happens. It's, it's, uh, I don't even know that we'd need to use the word regulation because it's just happening um, in that way. Um, I would love to know a little bit more about, about um, you guys, why, why, what brought you here today. Um, we'll have a, a moment for, uh, because we're a small group, you know, if you want to, if you want to uh, uh, share, you're welcome, you're welcome to share straight in. If you want to type into the uh, the chat box, um, do that as well, you know, but, uh, but wh why, why did you come to a talk on co-regulation? What, uh, what is it you'd like to hear about or, or leave with <laughs> um, that would uh, make this time valuable for you? Um, and if anyone wants to jump right in and either type it or, or just come and say hi, um, please do that. Let me see if I've got the settings right so that you can unmute yourselves. I'm gonna, now you can unmute yourselves. Kristen, lovely to see you. <laughs> yeah, you too. Um, I figured I would say something because uh, honestly, I feel like if I can self-regulate myself better and more evenly, that um, I'll be able to connect with my little that much better and she'll be able to self-regulate because she's two. She's a great kid, but I know that I mess up and I'd like to keep it a little bit more balanced for her development and for my sanity. <laughs> <laughs> Being a single mom doing it all and trying to take in conscious discipline and how to do this and how to do this right and, and trying to do it by myself in a world that doesn't speak the same language. Um, so trying to do the, my best. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, let's uh, one vote for sanity. Let's go with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Lena, is that uh, you want to share there? Come on in. Well, yeah, so pretty much along the land the lady spoke. Um, being single here as well, it's very hard not to be upset, not to be anger that's with it. Um, and I'm noticing I have a four year old, I'm seeing that anger being put to her now. Um, she will speak with that same tone as me. I'm like, where is this coming from? Then I look at my in the mirror, I'm like, yeah, well, <laughs> that's what you're teaching her. So I, I do to self-regulate. Um, it's just, I want to break that in because I think it's been carried from generation to generation. Maybe now I recognize what I mean is basically what my parents did. And I'm doing it. And if I don't break this cycle, um, that next generation is going to pain. Uh, so that's the reason I'm here. Hmm. And of course, to listen to the conscious story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Lena. There's a, uh, Danelle has, has written saying, uh, wow, involved in child care aware of Eastern WA is at Washington um, and has made a five year commitment to learning conscious discipline and to bring that to early learning facilities. I, I, I'm really fascinated. We'll see. Uh, I, because I know so many of you have got this, this base with conscious discipline as well. You know, it's, this is, conscious discipline is new to, to Laura, but, but I think she's a natural, right? So we're going to see as we hear from her perspective how, how it weaves so beautifully with things that we've been learning um, in the conscious discipline space. Mm. 
Um, thanks for typing that in. Debbie as well, need, need guidance to better co-regulate with students and their own teen girl and a mother who has Alzheimer's. Yeah. I can relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, elder care is similar to child care in a lot of ways. And my mother is mentally ill and requires a lot of care and she triggers me <laughs> just as my son does. So it's interesting. It's not just kids, right? It's anyone that we're, we're caring for that can, uh, that need us to be calm so that they can be calm. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Laura. And thanks, Tracy. Uh, three kids at home getting crazier and angrier. And um, uh, well, it's a statement you're making. We can examine it. I know I am the problem. All right. Um, and so it's great. Let's, uh, let's see if we can share the load. And I think that that's part of what Laura was saying is that there's a possibility to share the load in the family by having uh, regulated, aligned systems uh, supporting each other. Mm -hmm. um, so folks, that, that's um, a great segue for us to, um, to transition across to uh, Laura's presentation to get into some of the, uh, the, uh, the science of this. Um, Laura, over to you. Shall I okay, put that screen share up for you? Yes, please. So we're going to talk about what is the nervous system, because that is the title, that's in the title of our presentation. And, um, you know, I just thought it was relevant to take a couple minutes to actually explain what is the nervous system and how it works. So this is paramount to what I do every day in my office as a family wellness chiropractor. But our nervous system has two sections. It has a parasympathetic and a sympathetic. And it is literally the master computer of our body. It controls the function of everything else. Every cell of our body has, is controlled by the nervous system. So whether it's our cardiovascular or respiratory, elimination, digestion, all of it is essentially ran by this computer called our nervous system. And what we find is that the nervous system can be interrupted, just like any wires in any computer system can have um, things that slow it down, and that will impact how our brain communicates with the rest of our body. So with, as with chiropractic, the understanding is that when our spine specifically is in alignment, that's allowing the full um, communication of our nervous system to communicate and do its thing and that allows for healthy function of cells tissues organs um, the diagram over here on the right shows literally the nerve roots that come off our spine and how they go to every single part of our body the different areas of our body and when things are stressed on that part of our nervous system from misalignment how it will create these common symptoms that may not be pain oriented, but our dysfunction in how our nervous system is functioning, and that's the natural response of the body to cope with. Um, next slide, please. So what creates stress on our nervous system, um, as well as our structural alignment? Well, there's three main stressors. There's physical stress, which could be poor posture, um, certainly car accidents, you know, slips and falls, things like that. Uh, chemical stress, which could be medications, junk food, drugs, alcohol, and emotion, and also chemicals are in our environment, and then emotional mental stress. Um, and any of these types of stressors are going to impact how we hold our spinal alignment and how we, um, how our nervous system is able to flow and communicate. And what's interesting is when patients come into my office, for example, um, you know, sometimes there's a really clear cause of what's creating their misalignment and their, their symptoms. Um, but sometimes it's not so um, relevant, you know, it's not so apparent. And we have to dig a little bit deeper to be like, well, what are your stressors? What's going on here? And understanding that it's not just a physical cause to cause a physical symptom. It can be certainly chemical or emotional as well, that can still create those same misalignments in our spine and how that will impact our nervous system function. Next slide. 
So the reality is, is that our nervous system is wired to feel safe. And that is a very primitive um, wiring from caveman days. So I love this picture from the cruise. My, my three-year-old son is, is obsessed with this movie. But, you know, it's an, an example how, you know, cavemen had to be on that alert fight or flight situation because it meant life or death. And they had to be able to run from the tiger or fight and do whatever they did for survival. And those same parts of our nervous system still exist primitively in our, in our body. However, unfortunately with our current um, lifestyle, it can really create what's like a chronic fight or flight where we're over sympathetic. We're constantly feeling like we're being chased by a tiger when we're sitting at a computer for work, right? Um, and we're not in a life or death situation, but yet our nervous system feels the same type of stress. Um, so when we do feel this sustained level of high stress and are in this chronic sympathetic state, what we'll see is it negatively impacts the entire um, endocrine system and our hormones, not just specifically sex hormones, but the, all of the hormones in our body that make up our endocrine system, which is including the hypothalamus, pituitary in our brain, our thyroid, our pancreas, our adrenals, and then our sex organs. And what's interesting is we'll see, for example, I'll see um, patients come into my practice who have been under chronic high stress levels, and we'll see, for example, maybe their period is is you know off, or they're um, having a, a low functioning thyroid and symptoms related to that. Their sleep is disrupted. So all of these things coming from this chronic sympathetic state, and how we need to how I can help support them in getting that balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Because the reality is, is we need both. You know, we do need our parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest part of our nervous system. It's, you know, which is necessary. And we do need to have some level of stress to, to be, to function as well. But it's having that balance between the two and not being too high in the sympathetic state. Next slide, please. So what happens when our nervous system is stressed from either the physical, chemical, or emotional stressors? We'll see symptoms, certainly pain can be one of them. Pain, however, typically is the last symptom to occur. Um, and that's because the stress on the nervous system from an alignment perspective, especially when it's an emotional cause, can be quite subtle. And what we'll see first is things like poor sleep and um, irritable mood, improper digestion, poor elimination, um, shallow breathing, that, you know, chest breathing as opposed to the belly breath. And, um, and then over time, what we'll see is, is pain. So for example, I'll have a patient come into my practice, he'll be like, oh, I bent down to pick up a sock and I threw my back out. You know, and it's like, well, picking up a sock shouldn't throw your back out. It's not like you were, you know, just in a car accident or, you know, lifted a really heavy piece of furniture. Um, what that is indicative of, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. So there was stress, stress, stress being put onto that person's nervous system. And a very slight motion is all it took to literally, you know, their nervous system literally fell apart and was like, I can't. Um, you can't manage this anymore. And, um, and what's powerful is the nervous system is such a great teacher for us because the spinal cord only allows 10% of um, input to make it to our brain. So literally we are protected, like we don't feel and sense everything in our environment at 100% or we would be so flooded with, with signals and information that it would be overwhelming. So when that 10% crosses up and registers in our brain as pain or some sort of symptom, that is literally the light flashing on your car saying, check engine, this is, this is crucial. Um, and it's an opportunity to take action because what happens if we cut that wire that goes to our check engine light and ignore the reason why our light is on in the first place, for example, taking, let's say, an over-the-counter pain medication or um, something else to suppress those symptoms, 
then as opposed to addressing the root cause, then we're actually um, eventually the engine blows up, right? Because we didn't check the engine, we didn't change the oil, and our bodies, you know, are only going to be able to run for so long. So there's an opportunity when we get this feedback from our body to do something about it and 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 to help our body heal, because um, our body always wants to heal when it has the has what it needs to heal. Um, and I did have on here on the slide is dis-ease is essentially the opposite of ease, right? So when we're in a dis-ease state, it is an awareness that we're out of alignment and that's structural physical alignment, but there's certainly an energetic misalignment that can be occurring as well. So is that, is, is that a good cue that one can follow um, both, uh, both in your own body and within your relationships with the kids to say, ah, oh, there's, there's ease here or there isn't ease here um, uh, that, uh, that we could find a, a, like a compass bearing saying, hey, it's time to go back on course. Yeah, for sure. And um, that is just being really conscious, you know, of, of how you're feeling and how you're thinking, like what thoughts are coming up, how are you reacting to your environment, to your family, to your children. And if things are feeling stressed, then, you know, even I've seen with, um, with patients in my practice that, you know, people that develop chronic illness, that doesn't happen overnight, right? Like chronic illness takes years to develop. And um, that is such a, that's that their body was giving them signals and information way before that cancer diagnosis or way before that autoimmune diagnosis. So I think it's such a gift that our, um, our body, you know, the more that we're in touch with our body, the more information we can receive and the more we can uh, give back and care for our body and give our body what it needs to heal. And uh, Laura, I'm so curious for this next section, you're getting into the parent child uh, relationship. It's like, how do we know, how do we track ease or disease in, in our kids? Um, what's happening in the in the system there? Yeah, so I gave a, one example earlier about the colicky baby. Um, that was like that's you know you have somebody you have a child crying for hours <laughs> like there's something going on with that child's nervous system, and that's a pretty clear clear indication. Um, but you know even with older children, when you see older children, um, or even our, honestly, your, your intimate partner, when you see, see people, your loved ones that you're around on a regular basis, um, you know, re being reactive, then there's an opportunity to, and in my opinion, to really just take a reflection, like look at yourself and see like, what am I, what am I, um, marrying for this individual, right? What am I modeling? And um, we do know that the neurological system of young children is um, immature, and therefore they tend to be more right brain dominant, um, which means that they're more highly emotional. And anybody who lives with a toddler knows what I'm talking about. Um, they, that it's hard for them to be logical and incorporate their, their left brain because of um, the corpus callosum, which is the structure in the brain that literally physically connects the right and left hemisphere of the body, that is not fully formed yet. And so as adults and caretakers for children, it's really empowering that when you see a child who is in a highly emotional state and they're very upset, they're, they're having, going through a whole flood of emotions, the first thing you can do to help support them is attunement. And you can literally connect your right brain with their right brain so they feel seen and heard. And then that, um, and then bring in the left brain logic, you know, um, because going logic first it just typically isn't well received by a highly emotional, um, upset child. And, you know, it does take practice because when we see that those emotions, it's certainly easy for us to get triggered and we can be, you know, get into that right brain emotional state too, um, illogically. Um, but ideally as adults, and if we've certainly done any personal development on ourselves, we've been able to learn how to incorporate our right and left brains. And they're both important um, and they're both necessary when we're communicating, connecting and problem solving. 
So um, I think that's really important to understand that. Um, you know, I just, I remember my husband recently, or my son turns three next month and he was just kind of like, you know, trying to speak to him like an adult and like, no, that's not going to work right now. Like we have to, you know, we really have to be uh, mindful that he's of what his age is and how, you know, speaking to him with logic right now is, is not going to fly. So I think probably, you know, if everyone, most of the people on here are, have a conscious discipline background, you totally know what I'm talking about. The other book that I really like that's been helpful for me as a parent um, that speaks on this is The Whole Brain Child by Dr. Dan Siegel. Are you guys familiar with that? Um, that one has been really helpful for me to understand the actual neurological development of my child at certain ages and therefore how to best um, support support him in his full development. And you know, like Andrew mentioned, that subconscious mind is formed those first six, seven years of our life. And that's so vital for how we live and grow and develop for the rest of our life, even as adults. And um, you know, how powerful it is as parents and, and caretakers and educators to have that opportunity to help shape, shape our child's subconscious mind. So. Do I have an, another slide? <laughs> yeah, sorry, yes. You totally have another slide. I just like, I was loving what you were sharing. I wanted to see you more. So I just like, okay, I'm going to stop the screen share. Um, you definitely had your, your, uh, your, yeah, I love this. Children are uh, okay. Teachers. So this is my, my son Finley. Uh, I have a picture of him. He's here. He came to my office and got, got his adjustment. He's been under chiropractic care since he was born. And, um, you know, especially as a toddler boy, he's very active. He's constantly falling, bumping, you know, jumping off of things. And, um, you know, I know like checking him on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, checking his alignment has been very crucial for his development. I see that when he, his nervous system is stressed, he's not sleeping as well and then I'm not sleeping as well. So, you know, these types of basic physical things of how we sleep, how we poop, all, how, we, how we breathe, like all of these are controlled by our nervous system. And if they're not operating well, then it's really hard. Um, it's hard on the whole family, right? Um, so uh, let's see, nervous system. So yeah, we can get triggered. You know, uh, children are one of our biggest teachers. And we still have the opportunity to examine our own some of our own subconscious beliefs and it's specifically limiting beliefs that were formed when we in our early childhood and children have a great way of reflecting that to us um and you know even for example like a couple of weeks ago i found myself acting like my mother <laughs> i was like oh my god i can't believe that but that's because that's what i was taught the first few years of my life right and so it's like recognizing that and then being like well I, I'd like to do something different for my own son I don't need to I really appreciate um, the participant who talked about the generational um, component because there is generational um, things that we have as families right because we just we tend to just teach what we were taught, right? And so it really takes, I think, a special person to want to go above and beyond that and be like, I am going to, you know, acknowledge and thank my parents because I know they did the best they could. And, you know, how can I grow and evolve beyond that and actually um, parent differently? Mm -hmm. um, and then empowering ourselves and our children to take a time out. So that's a big one. Um, I think because certainly we, yeah, it's normal to have, you know, to be angry and have emotional floods that occur during certain episodes with our children, especially. Um, but how we react to that, I think is really important. And so if it just means that, you know, as the parent, you need to walk away for a moment to kind of compose yourself instead of reacting with anger or um, really encouraging the same of your child, I think that's really important. And then, you know, coming back together and talking and, and connecting with the right and left brains of how we can um, problem solve that, whatever, <laughs> whatever that trigger was. Um, okay, next slide. 
Okay. So modeling self-care, this is a big one that I, I practice, that I practice myself. And also I certainly preach it, um, especially cause I do take care of a lot of pregnant women and new moms in my office. And, um, you know, I think especially, and I'm going to speak more to the women in the audience, women as caretakers, as mothers, we really tend to take, you know, want to take care of our child first. And, um, at the detriment to our own health, uh, physically, mentally, and emotionally, and spiritually. And like Andrew mentioned at the beginning, when we um, we have to put our oxygen mask on first to be able to take care of those around us. And that is, that is just such a true statement. So when we model self-care, this is not being selfish. This is really just making ourselves a priority. And therefore, it, our children learn to also make themselves a priority and to also practice self-care. And I think there's really no, it's like one of the biggest gifts we can give our children. It's really even like a self-esteem, like I'm worthy of self-care. I deserve to take care of myself and my body and, and this temple that I've been given. Um, so a couple steps, a couple of quick tips I wanted to add here is hydration. This is a big one, especially in the summertime. Um, and it's so simple, but a lot of people really are walking around dehydrated. Our body is like 70% water. And so a quick and easy way to make sure you're drinking enough water a day is to take your body weight, divide it in half. And, um, cause that part's missing. Oh yeah. Half of your body weight. And that's the number of ounces of water you should ideally be drinking a day. And the days that you're exercising, sweating, and losing um, height, losing water even more so, you're gonna drink even more water than that. Um, and coconut water is also a great way to get your natural electrolytes in and your hydration. Uh, receive body work. So obviously as a chiropractor, I know that you know there's only certain things that you can do for yourself and then it's really wonderful to be able to receive from healers around you. Um, whether it's chiropractic, acupuncture, massage, any type of healing modality that's actually going to help take the stress off your nervous system. And in an ideal situation, you're scheduling ongoing maintenance type care. A lot of the patients in my practice will come in um, every two weeks and that's their maintenance schedule. And they're not just coming in when they're in pain because they know that's the last symptom and they want to be preventive and they want to keep their nervous system operating optimally. I think, I think it took me like 10 years of going to chiropractors before I, I grasped that point because I yeah. always waited too long, always got to the point where things got uh, painful. Um, I just thought I'm, I'm, the, I'm the cynical guy. I'm like, I'm not going to be sold something I don't need. Um, <laughs> and, and, then I, and then what I realized is, 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 oh, there, my mood just slipped three days ago. So I should have had that appointment four, you know, four days ago before that happened. And, and my digestion went to my sleep is out. And it's like, oh, when I actually do this every two weeks, um, I, I land into knowing I'm not going through this up-down cycle of, of balanced, out of balance, balanced, out of balance, balanced, out of balance. It's, that's so true. And it's, it, it's not necessary, right? We can be preventive minded. It's a similar idea of like, you don't just go to work out at the gym, you know, once a year, <laughs> like you don't just brush your teeth once a year. Um, so there is that ongoing maintenance, um, concept and, you know, it's, it is important. And I will say, you know, like, yeah, you, like you mentioned, it's like, Oh, somebody will notice their sleep is off or, their their period was more crampy this month like whatever it is it's the body telling you i need extra support here and i will i do, would like to add to that um that um during this pandemic that we've been experiencing the past few months i personally for myself have been feeling more stressed probably than i ever have in my life and on an ongoing basis and I had to bump up my uh, body work um, care from bi-weekly to weekly um, because I literally was like not holding my alignment. Like I would notice that about that one week mark, like, oh, this, I'm feeling off, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, that, that wasn't my typical schedule prior. So everyone's different on what their, their maintenance schedule looks like, but it's also an awareness that maintenance schedule can change based on the external environment and what's going on in your life. 
And if you have higher stress levels, then you need to do more to help yourself. Mm. Uh, Self-care, taking time to connect with our body. And that is great through either meditation, journaling, breath work, and then really being aware, like what body, what do you need? How can I support you? How can I um, nourish you? How can I love you at a higher level? Um, and your body will tell you, your, our body has so many ways to, to communicate and tell us exactly what it needs um, if we're willing to listen. Taking a break from technology is a huge one. Having time with nature and connecting with the, the earth, doing some grounding, barefoot walking in, on, the, on the earth, um, hugging a tree was Andrew's <laughs> suggestion when we were talking about this. Um, anything that you can do. I know for me also living in a city environment, when they closed down the parks um, at the beginning of this, um, beginning of COVID, it was very stressful for me. And, um, you know, it actually led me to getting, buying a house with a backyard <laughs> so that I could literally have my own plot of nature to connect with. And then positive thoughts, the power of manifestation, law of attraction. And I put Ro Ronnie Tobin's there. So Tony Robbins has been a big mentor of mine. And he actually is creating um, Ronnie, Ronnie Tobin's, which is a big blue gorilla animated with Tony's voice that is teaching <laughs> lessons to children. And that's launching 2021. So be tuned, be uh, on the lookout for that. But I think it's, he's going to have a lot of great information to share with kids. Laura, thank you. Breathing in, breathing out. I am, um, you know, as I sat with our theme of, of co-regulation and I listened to what you've been sharing through, uh, through that lens of co-regulation and just right at that last slide, you're talking about listening to the body and uh, in my in my training to work as a um, uh, as a healer, uh, um, you know, working energetically in the aura and chakra system, people might know it as no Reiki as one form. Um, I sort of did the the six year training as opposed to the weekend workshop because I like geeking out on things like this. And I think about that, and I think about this book, which is um, uh, an animal whispering story. Um, our body is such a strong antenna for what's happening, not only inside ourselves, but what's happening around us. And, uh, and this getting a relationship with this antenna function um, is, is super helpful in the parenting space. Uh, you spoke about the, the, uh, the development of that bridge between the left and the right brain that comes in uh, as children grow from a, uh, an energetic perspective until the age of seven, children don't have their own uh, um, energy field system fully developed. Um, from the chakra system model, it's a little bit like the screens on the front of the chakras aren't yet fully formed. What that means, you know, if that's not your language, what that means more practically is the filter between the world and them isn't yet um, informed and in place. Uh, so we know we often say kids soak things up or that they're, they're sponges and they just take everything in. It's quite literal. It like it comes in and there aren't yet a set of rules to govern the, uh, the response and the behavior um, and that's all being developed. And it's neat, you know, obviously we're seeing that kids need our help to develop those rules to govern how to respond in a difficult situation. Um, uh, you know, when, when anger comes through them, uh, or, or how do they lash out? Or do they find their way to discharge the anger and make their way to using their words? Um, all of which is to say, and as I hold that theme of, of co-regulating, uh, as, a, as a parent or a, 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 care, a caregiver to a child under seven, they will often come right into your, your bubble your space. Um, and they come, when they come into that space, they are borrowing your filtering system that you've developed and matured into. Now your filtering system is wonderful. It's more mature. It's also, you know, mapped with all of the 
mistakes that you've made about how the world's going to be and how we're going to treat you um, and the, the things that you you uh, misunderstood or learned incorrectly as you were growing up as a function of your childhood and all the wonderful things in every way that you were ever nurtured or loved or supported you've got all of that sitting in your system and they just come inside and they sit on your lap because until about seven they can still do that isn't it interesting that the size of seven and the, the times out with the size of being able to to kind of hang out on your uh on your lap as well um and they are inside your bubble and so you can you can use the force uh, um to to go ah okay let me breathe myself calm as we know from um Dr. Bailey, I wish you well, is such a, a powerful um, act because it sets up, us up into the giving and caring mode. And, it's, and so if we go, I wish you well, and we fill our bubble with that, you know, then we're starting to just slow down and uh, create that. Um, a, a, a harmony is a word that I would use to go with a co-regulated system. Harmony and disharmony are clues that we can track ease and dis-ease the same uh the same pointer that your your language that you're using um there laura um i am very curious to see if there, anyone's got questions in here because what you know this isn't a time that we can bring some questions in um i also want to say we've been sitting for too long and it is important that we stand and shake and wriggle a little bit so i'm going to do that and invite you um uh, up up just to, uh, I don't have a particular activity, but we can take in a breath. <sighs> Let our arms go up. <sighs> Do a quick check-in and see where you're at relative to when you started. So that question we asked at the beginning, um, this has been a lot of information, and so information can move you towards calmness or it can move you away from calmness, depending on your system, right? So. Um, just noticing uh, how the information is landing um, for you. And uh, Laura, question there from Debbie. Um, how is an Epsom salt effective? Do you know what that's doing in the nervous system? Um, yeah. So and, and, and what age can we do that for kids? Oh. I don't. That's a good question about the age for kids. I'm not exactly sure about that one. I was referring more to it for ourselves, but um, I was, I don't know. I don't know about the age, but the whole point of the story is, is that Epsom salt is magnesium. Magnesium is typically a, a mineral that we can be deficient in when we have very tight, tense muscles. And so magnesium is infused into our body when we're soaking in that tub and it helps to hydrate and loosen up tight, tense muscles. It also helps to pull toxins out of our muscles. Um, so there's an opportunity to, to get the, the lactic acid and other toxins that are in the superficial muscles out. Um, and one thing that I've discovered uh, about a year ago that has blown my mind is flotation therapy. Um, and that's been really a powerful way for me to completely calm my nervous system by going into a pod, which is essentially tons of Epsom salt and you're floating because there's so much of the Epsom salt and um, you're completely sensory deprivation. There's no sound, there's no light and you float there for an hour, 90 minutes, and um, talk about a deep meditation. <laughs> you have, your brain has nowhere else to go, and um, it just calms it, calms it, so. Yeah, I really wish I had a better answer about the age for kids. I was referring more for adults, but I know for me it's huge. Right, I, 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 there's a couple of things to, that one has uh, variance over that I'm aware of. One's the temperature of the water, and the other is the density of the salt. And then I guess the third is how long you spend in it. And so we can, we can choose that for ourselves in some way as an adult. Um, my, my preference is as hot as I can take with the highest salt quantity, but not for very long. Um, and that's how my system works. Then I climb out. I, I, I need some time out of the bath. I can't go straight to bed because there's so much heat in the, um, in the body that needs a little bit of space to discharge. And then... Um, uh, when I jump into bed, uh, I am light out 
gone, wake up in the morning going, huh? Oh, wow, good sleep. Um, and, and I'm going to use that as a little segue to come into my material about the last 20 minutes of the day because this is what I've been fascinated about. I've been, my TED talk is on why the last 20 minutes of the day matter. And I want to introduce you to um, this conversation from um, another perspective, which is to say, hello, these are the little brain people. Um, yes, I am a storyteller, so uh, I'm likely to come at this from a, a, a less scientific, more story-esque space. And here are the little brain people having a good day, to specifically at the front of the brain. And uh, the day is going well and everybody is cozy. And then something happens. Ah! Okay, oh no. And the little brain people at the front of the brain, which is where our executive function, our calmness, um, our centeredness is, uh, is all online, our curiosity, our creativity, they go dashing to the back of the brain, which is where our reptilian uh, uh, aspect of self is, and our fight or flight, the survival mechanism is in play right at the back of the brain. And, 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 and hello, that's the dog. Um, <laughs> welcome, hello, Arthur. Um, we did expect him to come and visit at some stage and we didn't know that it would coincide so beautifully with, oh my God, something's happening. <laughs> um, and it's a little bit like that. Now, um, we are, I think of us as, as somewhere between being uh, like a flock of birds or as humans or, or like being um, deer. Uh, and if we use the deer metaphor and the deer are hanging out, uh, grazing and everything's going well and one deer will will uh, spot something in the grass that looks out of place and they will everything goes into high alert in that deer and they go and their eyes come up their muscles go tight and they clench their buttocks um, and they, they kind of look around uh, 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 pronking with their nose kind of what is that smell smell we see sensing their environment it's just hyperactive alert state that goes, something dangerous is here. But it, the other deer don't just hang out and keep eating. Because the one deer did this thing over there, every single one in the herd goes, <gasps> and we'll, they all hold their breath, they all tighten their muscles, they all stop what they're doing, they stop eating, which is a very rested state, they go into this hyper aroused state and they look around them and they go, what is it that's happening? Um, and and this comes all the way back to that statement of going a, a, a stressed adult can't calm a stressed child. We have to calm ourselves first. We have to be that deer that allows our system to go, oh, it was nothing. But when the child on the other side of the room gets a frightened they go into their system, our system can't help itself but to go into that hyper aroused alert state. Um, and so um, as Laura was saying, um, yeah, uh, this isn't a moment for logical conversation. This is a moment for um, a transmission of calmness. Um, and I think if it was right brain to right brain, but for me, I'm, I mean, I can't locate my brain. I just know I have to, I have to go, I have to come into the calmness. And here's this little moment where the little brain people, we, we, the fact that neuroplasticity exists is our saving grace because when, when, when two slides ago, when, when things got scary, a, a particular pathway began to be mapped in the brain that was a pathway related to fear and to that event. And so the little brain people will run that pathway, that specific pathway going, it's dangerous, it's dangerous, it's dangerous, this is going to happen, I'm going to get hurt, I'm going to get hurt the same way I got hurt before, I'm going to get hurt again. And they keep going down that pathway. Um, luckily, we have neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity gives us a chance to change at the direction of that pathway um, and to reset how the brain is going to work. Um, and uh, how, the, why the last 20 minutes of the day? Let me just stop this share for a moment. What I realized about the trauma development formation process, the process of forming negative self beliefs, is that um, all pain happens in a moment of disconnection. Um, 
uh, the, it, like the deer, we hold our breath, um, we're going to fight or flight, um, and, and inside there's actually a moment um, if you're interested in the metaphysics or the energetics of it, where our consciousness and our energy separate and they go into different places, right? And then in the brain science of it, we start, we start mapping this negative neural pathway that is, that is uh, to call it negative is a little unfair. It's a protective mechanism um, and it's a valid protective mechanism when it first happened. But, um, you know, 40 years later, um, uh, when, uh, um, you know, it, it's not true that I can't go to the fridge and get some food. I'm no longer the baby in the, uh, in the cot that needs to be fed and hasn't been responded to yet. Um, so, uh, I hope that made sense in the moment. I'm going to take a breath for myself. I love this subject. I really, um, uh, I really do. And connection is the antidote to moments of disconnection. And uh, Dr. Bailey has kindly mapped what we need for connection. And she says, the four ingredients necessary for connection are eye contact, which we can do, touch, which if we're uh, exploring touch at the moment, it's a little tricky in some places, but you know, for a parent and a kid in the last 20 minutes of the day is something that's wonderful. Presence, so we're not on our phones and distracted, um, and a playful situation. And I believe that stories offer us um, that perfect setup where we can uh, engage with eye contact, touch, presence in a playful situation. We can offer connection, and in offering connection, we repair the moments of disconnection that have happened in the day. That repair goes all the way into the neural pathways, into the formation of a positive neural pathway, and if we can do that just before sleep, then one of the functions of sleep is to stabilize and enhance memory. And so we're going to then get eight hours of stabilizing and enhancing the positive memory from the recent connection that we had just before sleep. Um, and the thing about connection as well is that it usually takes more than one person. You can't do eye contact, touch, presence, and playful situation with yourself. Um, in the same way that you do it with someone else. And so co-regulation is happening through that encounter um, as we do story. So I would like to read us a story. We're going to get some of these uh, factors as we read the story together. Um, and again, take a little moment and go, how, how are you doing on the scale of one to 10 right, right this moment? Um, We've been here for an hour. That might be when you max out and your system goes down. Um, or you might go, oh, story time. <laughs> and your system might be going, anticipating something that, uh, that leads you into um, excitement. Um, and I like excitement as, a, um, as an energy when it's, again, when it's a regulated excitement that hasn't completely blown over into the, um, the three-year-old. That can sometimes happen. I'm just looking at my puppy, who is probably going to eat something he shouldn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, bring everything that we did into the story called The Hug Who Got Stuck. And all of my stories, every story, every story time starts with four simple breaths called the Snuggle Breathing Meditation. And I'd like to invite us to do that together now. And when we breathe in, our arms go up. When we breathe out, they come down. <sighs> and sometimes there's noises. So, um, uh, uh, putting your own uh, life mask on, on first. Breathing in, I breathe for me. Nice breath in. I breathe for you. I breathe for us. And I breathe for all that surrounds us. <laughs> you know where hugs are made? If you haven't seen the story before, have a quick thought. 
as we're about to find out. Um, I know not. What if I do it like that? Let's go to Okay. That's our snuggle breathing meditation we just did. Right. Gather round, children. Story time. <laughs> Once upon a time, on a very ordinary day, deep in the center of a very ordinary heart, an extraordinary thing happened. Deep in the center of this heart was a hug factory. The hug factory made the most warm, cozy, cuddly hugs. I, I, I do feel like I want to narrate this story a little bit as we go. So this story has taken us into a place inside our body. It's taken us to our hearts. And whatever your image of your heart is or your experience of it. It's like it got involved in the story. Now you're sitting next to your little one or your class full of kids. Everybody's gone into the heart. Um, and so there's a shared location that is beginning to resonate with everybody that's here in this story time or the story time that you're doing. Okay, let me show you the hug factory and how it works. Here's the door of the heart. Hugs come zooming in, they're full of love, that love glows brightly, it gets caught on the solar panels, the solar panels fill up the big green battery with love energy, the love energy then powers this light because deep in the center of your heart, there are baby hugs growing on trees, hydroponically drip fed by stardust, rainbow light, and a basket full of warm fuzzy feelings. Hmm. And when the hugs are ready, they get picked and they get taken, through into the encoding room. And so I'm gonna ask you later, who are you growing a hug for? Think about that for a minute, maybe put it into the chat. Who, who are you growing a hug for right now? Um, and then when the hugs are encoded, they get them zooming out into the world and we're gonna see that sign in a second. Each hug was freshly made and specially encoded with just the right amount of love and care to delight the heart it was made for. <gasps> Words, love and care. We're bringing love and care in. The story is bringing in an atmosphere and that atmosphere is shared. Um, so we're getting regulated together towards love and care. Being a hug wasn't always easy. Sometimes a lonely thought or bad feeling would trap a hug in a sticky web. Uh-oh, uh-oh, alarm bells. Um, here, let's see, nobody loves me. I'm anxious, who cares? I'm all alone, there's something wrong with me. Sticky thoughts, we call these sticky thoughts. Now, this is setting up a little quiver in my system. It's like, what's gonna happen? So to help hugs deliver their love and care, there was a big sign on the factory wall. Reminders to being a great hug. Breathe in love to glow brightly. Oh. Two, focus entirely on the heart the love is for. Yes. And three, don't pay too much attention to the web of sticky thoughts. Ah, we've got a lesson and a remedy embedded in here. On most days, you could see streams of hugs entering and leaving the door of the heart, zooming away like bees from a hive, but not on this day. On this day, there was a problem. One special hug on its way out of the heart got stuck, very, very stuck. This is the hero's journey of the story, the cliff hanging. You're no longer doing it alone. You're, we're doing it together. And this sets up a tightness in our connection that we're sharing this journey as we go on it together. This hug had forgotten the third rule. It fought against the web of sticky thoughts to get free, but every wriggle and squirm trapped the hug even more. Soon the hug ran out of breath and lost its glow. Inside, the heart became horribly congested with crowds of hugs waiting to get out. Unused hugs were put into boxes until every inch of space was filled up. 
outside the heart, there was also a problem. A traffic jam of visiting hugs couldn't get in to deliver their special love and care. Soon the factory stopped making new hugs. There was only one stuck hug in the center of one ordinary heart, but all around the world, hugs lost a little of their glow. Now, the number of times I've stopped at this point and said to kids, that's the end. And there's this pause. And then there's this like, no, no, that can't be the end. It's like, no, 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 no. And it's like, we as, as humans have had enough stories told to us that we expect a possibility of coming out from this dark, difficult place. In um, the therapeutic work that I do, it, we would talk here about a healing response. Um, here is a difficult moment, um, and we want to come through that difficult moment. We want the, the sadness that's being experienced at this moment of the story to crest um, and for it to be metabolized through the body, um, or the adult body can help metabolize it through the child body as we're learning. Um, and when that gets metabolized through, then we're going to get back to a better place than we're in now. Let's see what happens. The hug side helplessly. Can we all sigh together? <sighs> Changes everything. Sigh, 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 sigh. Every time you can sigh, get your kids to sigh. Just, it's fabulous. <sighs> it stopped wriggling, stopped squirming, and stopped fighting. In that moment, something magical happened. As it stopped wriggling, it breathed in love and glowed brighter. Oh, yes, I remember that from earlier on the board. As it stopped squirming, it remembered the heart it was made for. Hmm. As it stopped fighting, it slipped right past the web of sticky thoughts. Free! Yay! Oh my God, I can feel myself smiling already. On the inside, every cell in my body is starting to feel happier. The hug glowed brighter and brighter, zooming away toward the one special heart it was made for. Yes, it's going to get its victory. It's going to deliver the love. The hug factory clinked and whirled back to life. A flood of hugs passed in and out of the heart, each delivering their special love and care. We're back in the heart. We're back in happiness. We've got brightness. We've got love and care being featured again. It was just one hug who got unstuck in the center of one ordinary heart. And all around the world, an extraordinary softening happened. <sighs> Yay. The end. And for those of you who know the story, you'll know that there's a little hug meter at the end and there's some question and answer. And again, this is engaging. How do we create connection, eye contact, touch, presence in a playful situation? These are some of the tools that will get us to creating connection. Why do we want to create connection? Because connection is the antidote for disconnection. And our kids, every day of their life, if it's a normal, ordinary day, will have experienced a moment of disconnection. Somebody said something mean to them. Somebody said something they didn't like. They didn't want to hear. Some moment didn't go the way they wanted it to go. They've got that little fright eyes that we saw um, happening somewhere in their neurophysiology. We can reconcile that and repair that by giving them kindness, connection, playfulness um, in those last minutes before bed. And I think if you've done this, you'll notice they start chatting and sharing and opening up and um my last my last observation about story um before we open up to to share and, and uh, hear from you guys is um uh, i want to talk about just three postures the posture of front to front when i'm a, i'm a parent or a, or a teacher and i'm it's, it's time to put your, put your pajamas on, brush your teeth and get ready for bed. I'm in a front to front position. It sets up a certain rank often and I have rank and power over. Um, I, know, I know, you know, in many levels, we learn to, to come down to the eye level contact with the kids to meet them and to help. Um, that is an act to help regulate calmness that we would do that. Um, 
But what, what story time does is it turns us side by side. Here's our book and we open the pages and, and together we go into story. Um, we go into this world of story together. You're probably next to me um, or curled up in bed or in circle space even um, and story time at school stuff. And the side by side posture um, is a very calming one. Um, and it's one where we feel like the person is an ally or a friend um, as opposed to an authoritarian um, and, uh, and any material around control. So if you want to help settle a nervous system again, um, often it's uh, something that you can use to come change your posture. Um, uh, in your adult relationships, certainly in my adult relationships, I'm often like, have the best conversations when I'm on a long drive. Um, why is that? Um, we're, we're both look, look, looking out and, and we're side by side. So, um, uh, so things here. Hello, Arthur. Enough of, enough of Laura and I talking. Please, what is, what, what are you sitting with? Laura, ask a question. I'm, I'm like, uh, if we're practicing our conscious discipline, I can say to Arthur, um, Arthur, you were barking um, to let me know that the delivery man is outside. Thank you, that is very helpful. If you want my attention, please just come on over and nuzzle me on the side and I'll uh, see what I can do. <laughs> this is, I get to practice my dog a lot. I don't have enough kids around me at the moment to, um, to do this practice with. Um, so, uh, guys, wow, time is, time is just running. We've got like, like, please jump in. Kristen, what, uh, what, what, are you, what are you sitting on as you listen to this? How is this helping you? What are your questions that you still got? Debbie, I know you've got a whole many classes of little ones that you're uh, custodian and care for, as, uh, uh, as also Emily and Angelica um, in the teaching roles. Um, you know, maybe someone's got a question that, uh, um, that you're going to answer for each other. That doesn't even have to come from Laura and I. Emily, jump in. Um, this has been amazing and I've just been typing away, taking notes. So thank you both so much. Um, so I'm a teacher and I teach first grade and a question that kept kind of coming up for me is if you guys, um, I guess speak to how to share some of this information with parents or if that's even necessary to share. I, I, I always find myself wanting to share like the conscious discipline or sort just different resources. So um, maybe if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I think, I think if it, when we're cultivating a school family, you have to be sharing your values all, all the time, all the time. And, and again, through whichever medium and channel is going to access the, um, the parents. So, um, years ago, I worked in a, in a, in a hospital working with patients in coma um, and a neurosurgery ward. And we knew that we needed pamphlets so that we could talk about it in that way. We needed classes so that we could talk about it that way. We needed videos so that we could do it. And we needed to keep layering the information. And um, uh, as, we, as I know you know, this is a never-ending learning process. Um, and so, you know, every time you get a little like, aha, oh my word, this is great. This, here's what I learned from Andrew and Laura. It's like, put it into one sentence and share it with your community. Um, and, and if you want us to come and do this with your community, that's what we're here for, right? Uh, and we can say that confidently uh, on behalf of Laura and I that, you know, we, we, we want to help. Uh, and and Emily, I've seen your wisdom like in so many places. It's just sometimes like in the parenting space um, for you know uh, uh, tweens and teenagers, you can't deliver the content anymore, 
right? <laughs> you know, the teenager is not going to hear it from mum. And so by that stage, hopefully there are many uncles and many aunts in place that are, that are well positioned um, and mentors. And it's like, if you can see that you're not the person to deliver it into your school community, because they're just like, they're emily outed. They're, they're like, it's like, we're done with, we're done. oh my God, Emily's got another expiring thing, right? Um, then it's like, then, then it's okay, take a breath, bring in an ally, let it, let it be delivered through the, through the channel that is open. Because again, that is um, um, following the ease and following where flow can happen. Laura, did you have anything that you would echo? Yeah, I mean, that's tough. You have, it's, you know, you have to, ideally have people that are open-minded that are open to hearing what you want to share and i guess that's also where you start attracting a community of like-minded people so ideally um that's just part of your environment is people that are resonating with a similar message or certainly are at least open to learning and growing mm -hmm. um debbie uh I'm going to read it the way you wrote it. And uh, I feel I can regulate my emotions well for a while. I can be patient at first, but the longer I have to wait for that connection or calm and needed actions from the other person in my family, the emotions build up until it's very difficult to continue to regulate. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, and... Um, if, if I'm understanding Laura's voice in this, part of this would be to say systemically make sure that you set up for the best possible tolerance of these moments. Would you, would you agree with that, Laura? Yeah. I mean, I, one example that just pops to my head right away is um, when my mother would call me and I knew that my mother really needed me to be very calm every time I answered the phone and would be needing a lot from me. I couldn't answer that phone if I was not in a state to be able to manage that because I would answer like, Oh, it's my mom. I feel guilty. Let me answer the call. And then I would be yelling and screaming at her on the phone. And I knew that I, I didn't set myself up for success. So if I had to like, let it go to voicemail, call her back when I was in a better state, then that's what I would do. And I know in like a real life case in at home, if you find yourself like not in that state, that's maybe where you have to send yourself to time out you know, take your Epsom salt bath, you know, do what you need to do to take care of yourself and then return to the situation. And, and, and here's where, um, you know, mindfulness, all of the mindfulness, all of the meditation movement, all of that is um, preparatory in the same way that, uh, you know, if you, if you like the chiropractic care model, which I certainly like, and Laura, Laura's a great advocate for it, it's like, okay, every two weeks I'm going to go so that I've got more tolerance inside my system. Now, the classic thing that I do in the situation that you're talking about, Debbie, is it's like I get to that moment, I'm patient. I, I, I might not be able to clearly identify that, that I'm looking for calm or I'm looking for connection, um, and so what I do is I, I feel a little bit like, uh, and then what I do is I go and eat a packet of M&Ms, um, which is high sugar, you know, and the last thing I need, and it pushes my system either further out. It's a, it's a pacifier or an attempt at a pacifier um, uh, that I, I would go. And so, that, you know, those are the moments where um, I, I've got a fun little video somewhere of me doing star jumps, jumping jacks, I think you all call them, um, uh, the whole way across America. It's like the number of times I will stop in a day and do 25 jumping jacks. Um, uh, the moment I catch myself, uh, it's like, shake it off. Cross the midline is one of, one of, the, um, uh, uh, one of the top tips that uh, I'm going to leave you with. And it's one of the reasons we did this left eye, right eye thing is it just gave this little moment for us to cross the midline. We do it a few times. The brain gets a little scrambled in it, and then it's actually unscrambling a bigger scramble <laughs> that's, uh, that's going on because it's kind of become rigid in seeing the world in a particular way. And, and when we cross it like that, we link these, uh, these hemispheres and it gives us, uh, it gives us a better uh, way to navigate that moment. Um, I want to want to want to just say to you, Debbie. I want to like bow to the vulnerability in the moment. 
that that vulnerability of that moment that says, um, I'm looking for connection and calm right now, and I'm not getting it. And it's mm-hmm. like, <sighs> because there's an echo there somewhere, for sure, from a certain age when you needed calm and needed connection genuinely, and it wasn't there in the family of origin, usually. And again, um, as an adult, we can step in and take care of that, take the breath, calm ourselves, and then transmit that calm. And we can go and create the connection that we want um, and model it um, in a way forward. Much of the time, it takes a long time to co-regulate with a family member and it's taken time away from working and that causes me stress. Anybody else know that? Hands up. <laughs> like, yeah. Any other wisdom pieces or any other questions that relate to that might? And, and again, one of the things when, when uh, uh, that emerged in the conscious discipline thing, and Laura and I agreed on this, it's like, in this moment, Debbie, we can meet you. We can offer advice, you know, but those are different things. Right. And again, you know, I, I, you let us know what it is that's right for you. I realize I've been talking in an advice giving way and it might not have been what you needed. And apologies if it was just that what you needed was just to say what you needed to say. Uh, ah! Thank you. I wish it was easier. Yeah. <laughs> advice is good. Thanks for letting us know. That's great. Lynn, any any uh, challenges you're sitting on on your side? Or... Um, I have a question. It's uh, adding what they said. So, for example, if I'm being with uh, my daughter, she's upset, upset, and I've spoken a couple of times. You know, can't have now, can't have it now, and she continues. So I leave just to keep my sanity to cool myself. There she's fuming. She's just being, it's just getting elated and now she's not getting the attention right away that is making it worse. And for me, so I don't want to deal with it right now because it's getting things uh, bad. So I go away from this. How do I <laughs> like it has to be fast because they're the one who has to go so hard. Um it's just switched. How fast can I just bring my down, calm well? And I sent you anything you can provide an advice with uh, on this, please. It, I, my, my wish for you is to have the experience of being in the midst of it and knowing your breathing whilst you're doing it there's a there's a little witness capacity that i'm referring to here it's like just as i'm talking to you here i'm like i'm so no i'm choosing to modulate i'm choosing to breathe you know it's not this because often we have to step away from these moments as like in our own in our own four-year-old going (laughs) and that's what we've got to do to start that's great. And then we slow the breath and we extend the out breath, like you're blowing out a million candles on a cake. I mean, you will get your, an eye roll from your kid. You need to know that. They will go, oh, God, what are you doing? doesn't matter if you get to be the one person in the room that's got some calm. Physiological calm. Like... The tightness goes. I often pay attention to my eyes and go, oh, I'm going to soften my eyes. So maybe just as we're sitting here now, you can just soften your eyes like a little bit. Because our eyes are the first place that go. Danger's coming at me. So we just soften our eyes a little bit. And, and, Using Laura's feedback of going, you know, be, 
what can you do to attend to your family system in advance of this moment uh, that's happening? To what can we attend to you, your system? Like, okay, I know I'm getting enough rest. I know my, uh, my nerves, nerve system is aligned um, uh, in the way that you choose to do it, acupuncture, massage, chiropractic. I know that I've got my care, that I'm not in my overwhelm because if you're topping out like and, and the, the camel straw, that last straw is last straw, last straw, last straw, then um, we know how that looks in someone. I mean, I, I think you probably know how it feels in yourself, but you also know how it looks when it's like, well, that really wasn't such a big thing that I asked you to do. And oh my God, look at the size of the drama that came out of it. Um, that's a clue that there's overwhelm in the system um, and that there's a need for discharge energetically. And um, uh, when I look at it in a, in a client on a healing table, it's often like, like a person seems to have partitioned themselves, their heads over here. And then there's like a line there. Uh, Laura's nodding, you know, and then it's like, there's a whole chunk of energy in the solar plexus. That's just really kind of got like a little festering going on. And then like the feet aren't even connected to the hips. Um, um, and then it's like, actually, if we remember that song and you know, the, the what is it? The knee bones connected to the thigh bone, thigh bones connected to the, and and I know that Laura's work will bring wholeness and I know that my energetic healing work will bring wholeness to the system and then the system can metabolize in a way that it just can't do um, when these partitions are, uh, are in place. And then again, uh, I, I, Laura, the one thing I want to hear more about is, is like, what's it like to work on, on like an infant, you know, on like, like uh, at, and like what ages and i also want to i just want to pause for a moment to acknowledge time we did say we oh, did yes. say like oh my god we're like we're here like so so we there's a way that i like to do this um which is for us to complete and then keep talking for those who need to go um and um uh the completion is uh, uh um, kristen's got something to share in a minute as well kristen let's do this this little wish well to honor all of those who do need to go because we said we said it would be this long and then the recording will come out and you can always run forward 90 minutes and watch the last uh, however long we sit and chat for um thumbs up if that sounds okay great thank you that's great i'm like one day somebody's gonna go ah, and i'm gonna go i don't know what to do with it um um breathing in Breathing out. Um, thank you for your commitment, your commitment to put yourselves first, your commitment of this time to learn something, to come into the conversation about co-regulation. Uh, I really hope that this is serving you today, right in this moment, um, and will then ripple out and help you and your families and your uh, your children in your care um, over the many years that you're dedicated to being such great teachers. Um, and um, I'm going to do the Becky Bailey one from my heart to yours. Uh, I wish you well. Thank you very much. Uh, Laura, if you would like to offer your farewells and gratitudes. Yes, I'm very grateful for everyone to come on today and, and connect. And I, you know, I, I learned something from, from everyone that shared and, you know, that was our intention from the beginning was to just get collective wisdom and that, you know, it wasn't just Andrew and I being the experts on nervous system co-regulation, but that we all have um, pieces of wisdom to share and support each other. So thank you. Wonderful. And so, Mark that on the timing, and then let's uh, and then let's chinwag. So whoever wants to chit chat, whoever has to go, really many blessings. Thank you so much. Um, uh, it's so good to see you. Um, and then um, uh, uh, let's do that thing where you hit the space bar and say uh, thank you. And then Kristen, I would love to hear what it is that you yeah you have up your sleeve. So we're gonna do one big thank you. Or 
Okay, let's do one break. Thank you. Uh, if you hit the space bar, I'll unmute you and we can go one, two, three. I wish you well. Thank you. 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 Um, so it's really quick and it's really easy. It's called a first aid technique and I learned it from my chiropractor recently and it has saved it saved me it's so many times and it works so um, so well and um, if you just put your hand out in front of you and then you grasp your the edge of your wrist just with your three fingers just not not like your death grip but when I'm really stressed I seem to put my nails into my wrist and then you're just going to take your palm and put it on your forehead and then take some nice deep breaths you can feel a difference when you're really stressed out in doing this. And I take, you know, like three or four deep breaths and then I can switch my hands and then do the other side. Um, and so when um, my daughter is really stressful and I try to tell her to take a breath, I'm like, take a breath. <laughs> and I, now I've been saying, mama's gonna take a breath. I'm like, you're really stressing me out. I need to take a breath. And then, so I've been doing this and she will mimic me and we'll put our hands on her head. Um, but when you're in a really stressful point, whether it's, um, you know, in a convert, like I did it in a conversation with somebody, like they were like bringing me way up and I was pretty, my tears were coming out of my eyes. I was starting to shake and I just did this first aid. I just did this and she's talking to me and I was like, well, I'm just gonna do this until I can continue into this conversation. So that, that was it, that's the, um, so the next time you're in a heightened state, it's a it's a pretty easy. And, and so that's a great. I noticed my number went up. My number between one and ten. That moved me right there. I mean, yeah. completion as well helped me. It's like, oh, we're at the end. There's something that, oh, okay. And then and then, oh, it's such a nice. There is a cross brain thing going on there, isn't there? There is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. It's a cross brain, and I and I know there's a reason why that with these, you know, it's hitting some meridian points, and you know, in Asian technique, and I'm, just, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff, and this is close to when you're doing, when you're nauseous, you know, this is a point is in here too, um, when you're like driving and and are feeling nauseous, you can get those little button things to go on your wrist. So there's a lot going on with the end of our um, energy fields, and then if it you want to keep it kind of subtle you can do this and it kind of expels some energy out of there so like eft tapping and then um you know getting rid of the energy like this so if, if i'm talking to somebody sometimes i first try to do this and then if it doesn't work i'll do some karate chops and then i mean if it's really bad i just go straight <laughs> so yeah. and it just uh, it's just something inside me just sort of warms and spreads i don't it's it's crazy so that's uh, wonderful. I think that that more than half of it is the act of recognizing you need something and then doing it. It felt like a protective boundary. You know, I think that's also important. Hmm. Lovely. And and kids and karate chops go together, right? Yeah. yeah Sage, Sage like looks at me. She's like, "What are you doing?" And I'm like, "Mama needs to breathe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I am really upset right now, baby." And she'd be like, "Mama." <laughs> you just start doing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Can I share another technique which people might find interesting if they like? Yeah. That? It's, um, it's from like a brain training program, but it's one you can do slightly more subtly, maybe. <laughs> and um, so, like, you would cross your left leg over your right leg, and you would cross your left arm over your right arm, hook your fingers, mm -hmm. and bring them up. And just kind of sit with it in your chest and it's it's really calming um, and it seems I can it gives me goosebumps and I can kind of feel it calms the atmosphere so you're, especially with kids again at bedtime when bedtime's going crazy um, I can kind of not engage with their craziness and sit and do this and they will come into it do you know what I mean they'll kind of come into that calmer energy and so that's quite a nice technique. And, and if you can't do legs and arms, you could do one or the other, you know, just as a way of, I think it must be another midline mm -hmm. um, crossing. Just exercise. Yeah. 
there's a sure, there's, like there's a boundary thing that's happening in that space and this is quite useful for the um kids who are over well, i don't i mean let's just for simplicity call them sensitive kids who have or for us who have porous boundaries you know when we're deeply affected by being in a space or somebody else moving or somebody over there is having a, a, a challenging mood um and again debbie this might be something that you try in your situation where you can't get to the 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 harmonized thing and there's a longing for that harmonized thing it's like i'm going to take care of myself and it's like i'm going to go into my space because yeah. now i'm in my space i've crossed everything um, <laughs> uh you know there isn't energy i'm not really open to to connect uh i'm just gonna the connection is all internal and there's a certain way that 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 um puts a boundary up where energetically we might be a bit porous so we might have a little bit of like a you know the those of us who have have this wonderful horribly named thing called codependency i mean we're supposed to grow up in a village so we need interdependency but if we're still working out how to have that in our you know in its healthy form it's really useful for us to be able to close the door and this is one way to kind of close the door and still be present in the room so i love that angelica you got some wisdom for us always i know that's why i'm asking i do listen i just love to listen i learn more when i listen than when i speak so yeah i enjoy it so much thank you thank you so much thank you what are you taking away from today me uh well a lot i always take a lot i think um a lot on the nervous nerve nerve system about uh, when it's so distressed, it's how the, um, the eels start. And I think it, that was um, very shocking for me. Like, so I more stressed with adults than when ch that with the children. So, it's very, uh, I, it's very different. I see a lot of teachers that they try to, um, try to co-regulate for helping the children. And I do a lot to try with adults. And, um, and every, every sentence is very interesting to me. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I, it, 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 I, in my imagination, I'm seeing a masseuse as a resident in every school, right? So that the teachers can go and get their feet rubbed for like 10 minutes, right? Just, uh, just between classes or uh, whatever it is that's happening. And so that, so that self-care is, again, modeled systemically to everyone it's like let's model it to the kids let's offer it to the teachers let's uh, let's have the parents coming through going oh you know this is great why is it that you know the school family isn't the school village where uh where we we uh, we spend a little more time uh, in community in in ways that are different so i, I don't know how far-fetched that idea is but you know you, if you want it, if you want it, build it. You can use it. I give it to you for free. You know? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that'd be great. Um, yeah, it's it's a difficult difficult time for me uh, being the start only the journey about conscious discipline and my school and being so Christian, so traditional. Um, don't believe a lot on um, the brain studies, so I have to learn to correlate with my with my director, and I have two weeks already on school, and it's like everything I I try my breathing. I try it's like I need something more because sometimes my breathing is not. It's just I feel my system still 
shaking. So I just appreciate all the ideas to mm. to help out. You will see me probably <laughs> next week because um, it's hard when they don't believe on your on what I I'm doing. So mm. I'm trying. Can can we help you in this moment, Angelica? And would you be open? Would you be open to to a little experiment for us to help you? Sure. Okay. All we're gonna do is wish you well. Oh, that's wonderful. And all you need to do is nothing for a moment. Okay. Okay. But you don't need to wish anybody else well. You don't need to take care of anyone. Um, we've got you for this moment. Uh, we see your uh, your love and your passion and your commitment to the kids and to learning for yourself um, and everybody who feels that you would like to wish uh, uh, our friend well, taking a nice breath in, connecting with your heart and wishing you well. We wish you well. Thank you. <laughs> Just sit on it for a moment. We get to sit in what it feels like to give and you get to sit in what it feels like to receive. And our shared nervous system lands another notch because you allow us to gift you in this way. Anybody else feel like they want to receive some of that yummy? <laughs> Kristen, you're claiming it? You're like, send it to me. I want it. I want it. Totally. I would definitely, I would never turn down something like that from such good souls. <laughs> okay. Let's send Kristen some love. Okay. Breathing in. We wish you well. Maybe can we do that for everyone? We can. We can do it for everyone. But there's something different about doing it one at a time. Would you be open to receive some, Debbie? Okay. Send Debbie some love. We wish you well, Debbie. Tracy, you want some of the good stuff? Okay. Tracy, we wish you well. Hmm. Lynn? Like some of this? Hell yeah. <laughs> Lynn, wonderful. We uh, connect with our hearts and we wish you well. Mm. Keep anchoring this in as an experience in your, the cells of your body for everyone as we do this, because you're going to be able to borrow this anytime. Lena, you'd like some? Lena, breathing in to receive. We wish you well. Fabi and Laurie, I don't know if you guys are there. I'm going to send you some love. So we'll wish Fabi well. Mm. 
We're in the hug factory. We're remembering the heart that the love is for. And so we'll send some wish wells to Laurie. Um, Laura, you'd like to try this out? I'm so calm. <laughs> so, that was an amazing exercise. That really calmed me, calmed me down to the next level. Well, um, so I'd like to take you. it one step further for you and just let us wish you well. And then I'm going to let everybody wish me well because I'd like to just receive that. So first, first a breath in to wish Laura well. Beautiful. And I'm ready to receive. We wish you well. Hmm. And thank you. From this place, we send a wish well to all of the children in our care. I'm like, yes, 10. I got to 10. <laughs> it's not a competition. <laughs> no, but it's a nice, but it's nice hanging out here, right? <laughs> right. What a beautiful place for us to end on. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I never quite know that a moment like that can arise, but uh, I do hope that you can feel it in your body, that you can anchor it in you, that you can... It, when we do this together, it takes some of the overwhelm out of our system. It, uh, it gives us a little bit more space inside. Um, and both the act of receiving it and this beautiful act of gifting and gifting and giving. Um, so, like, how do we end? I just want to hang out now. <laughs> <laughs> We'll see you guys later. Thank you. Yeah, yeah this is wonderful. Best place to leave it. Mm -hmm. mm. Many blessings. Bye. Thank you. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.